free radical halogenation. It's going to be the first lesson in a chapter on radical reactions. And this lesson, we're specifically going to go over chlorination and bromination and pay lip service to what's called allylic or benzylic bromination using NBS. Uh, in the next lesson, we'll go through the mechanism of free radical halogenation. In the third lesson, we'll go through and talk about NBS specifically, including its mechanism. And, and then finally, in the fourth lesson, the last lesson of this chapter, we will revisit one of the earlier alkene reactions, the addition of HBr and peroxide, which adds H and Br anti-Markovnikov, you might recall. Uh, we just never covered the mechanism because the mechanism is a radical mechanism relevant to this chapter, which is why we'll cover it here. Now, this lesson's part of my new organic chemistry playlist, and I'm releasing them weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you want to be notified every time I do, subscribe to the channel and click that bell notification. All right, so free radical halogenation, and we're going to start off, it's going to involve either chlorination or bromination. And these are substitution reactions. They are going to replace a hydrogen with a halogen. So just want to make sure we realize that. We don't often talk about them as substitutions because when we use the word substitution, we think of like SN1, SN2. Well, this is an SN1, SN2, but it is a substitution. We are just simply going to replace a hydrogen with a halogen. And we'll start with chlorination here, and we'll see the reagents here are Cl2 and light, H nu here. You, you learn that's the energy of a photon of light back in Gen Chem, and it's the symbol we use for light, and you have to use light of just the right wavelength to break the chlorine-chlorine bond in Cl2. Now, it turns out you can also use, instead of light, either heat or a radical, what we call a radical chain initiator, like a peroxide. So light's the most common one you'll see, and it's probably the one I'll use pretty ubiquitously here, but you could see heat or an epoxide here, uh, I'm sorry, heat or a peroxide here pretty commonly as well. So if we look at what's really going on here, we've got a couple of different products here, and you look at the different hydrogens on here, and there are two hydrogen environments here, and if we replace any single hydrogen with a chlorine, that would be called a monochlorination reaction here, and, and it leads us to two products here. That's these two here. I can place either one of the two hydrogens on that carbon to get this product, or any one of the six hydrogens on these two carbons, since they're equivalent, to get this product. It didn't matter if I put the chlorine on the right-hand side or the left-hand side. It's the same thing either way, one chloropropane. Cool. Bromination works exactly the same way, and, uh, but the result's going to be a little bit different, as we'll see. So, and you can't tell the difference just yet, but what you'll find out is that the bromination reaction is much more selective. So the chlorination, turns out, you look at all the possible products and you can expect to get a bunch of all of them. So at least a fair amount of all of them. But with bromination, if you look at your different products, it's a much more selective reaction. And if you kind of take a look here, we've got the bromination on a secondary carbon here and on a primary carbon here. And what you'll find out is that you are overwhelmingly going to get just this product on the left. I'm not saying you'll get zero of the product on the right, but you're not going to get very much. So bromination is a nice reaction in that respect if you're trying to selectively get a single product uh, much better. Whereas again, with for chlorination, way less selective as we'll find out. And we'll talk about it in the mechanism, why exactly it's so, uh, not so selective, but bromination is. Uh, but you can expect to get a mixture of products. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about how you come out with predicting relative ratios of products and stuff like that. And that's what this lovely table will be for when we get there in a second. Uh, but before we get there, I do want to talk one second, and it looks like I pressed up against the board here, so let's get that back in place. Uh, but I want to talk about what's called allylic or benzylic bromination. And if you've got an alkene and you identify your allylic carbon, or if you've got a benzene ring and you identify your benzylic carbon, so reminder that allylic means one carbon away from an alkene, or benzylic means one carbon away from a benzene. So, and specifically, it turns out you could try to use like bromine here, and it turns out you're going to end up getting a mixture of products. So Br2 can actually react with either an alkene or benzene in other reactions besides the one of interest here. And so we end up using a, a little bit different reagent called NBS, which stands for n bromo 6 -cenamide. We'll have a whole lesson on this in the third lesson in this chapter. So, but I just want to allude to it here. And so if your goal is to specifically brominate in the allylic or benzylic position, this is the reagent of choice. Cool, it turns out just using Br2 and light would not accomplish the task very well. You get a bunch of side products in addition to your desired product here. So if your goal is to brominate either allylically or benzylically, don't use Br2. So use NBS instead. Like I said, we'll come back to talk a little more about NBS. So I just want to allude to it here and just kind of show the three different free radical reactions, but we'll spend a whole extra lesson on this one later in the chapter. All right. So if we take a look at chlorination and bromination yet again, so we said that chlorination is not so selective, but bromination is highly selective. So, and in this case, we can kind of get an idea 
uh, based on some ratios here. So with chlorination, it turns out you are five times more likely to replace a tertiary hydrant than a primary hydrant. And you are 3.6 times more likely to replace a secondary hydrant with a primary hydrogen. So that's kind of the way those ratios work. Well, with bromination, you are 1600 times more likely to replace a tertiary hydrant than a primary hydrant, and 99 times more likely to replace a secondary hydrant with a, uh, than a primary hydrogen. So all of a sudden, this is a reflection of that selectivity where it prefers replacing a hydrogen on the most substituted carbon possible, overwhelmingly so. So if we take a look at what's going on here, so if I, I told you that, uh, you know, I was 10 times more likely to win the lottery than you today. So then you might tell me, well, Chad, go play the lottery. So, and if I said, well, then who's more likely to win the lottery, me or you? Well, you actually can't answer that question. You might be like, well, you just told me you're 10 times more likely. Well, that's assuming we buy the same number of tickets. But let's say I buy one ticket and you buy a thousand tickets. Well, even then, you know, ticket for ticket, I'm 10 times more likely to win. You bought a thousand times more tickets and you factor both things in and now you're a hundred times actually more likely to win the lottery today. So I'm 10 times more, you know, luckier if we will, but you bought a thousand times as many tickets, which overwhelmingly makes up for that. And then some, well, the same kind of thing here, when you're, when you're looking at your different chlorination and bromination products, if you want to predict relative amounts of these products, you got to factor in you know, how much more likely you are to substitute at one position versus another, but then also how many chances do you have? So to get this product right here, I've got to replace either one of the two hydrogens attached to this carbon. And so they're not just one chance, there's two chances. So, and it's on a secondary carbon there. And so the likelihood here is 3.6, if you will. And so we're gonna multiply this by 3.6. That's gonna get us 7.2. And if we look at, you know, the likelihood of, of replacing one of the hydrogens to get this chlorination product. Well, again, there's any one of these six hydrogens, any of the three on this carbon or any of the three hydrogens on this carbon. And so we've got six chances now for this one. And in this case though, but it's on a primary carbon. These are both primary carbons. And that's just got a, a, a likelihood, if you will, of one. And six times one is six. And so this can kind of give us some relative amounts here. And so what we'll do is we'll take and add these together to get a total of 13.2. And so the likelihood here of getting this particular product is 7.2 out of a total of 13.2, just adding up the sums of all the products that are possible here. All right, and then the likelihood of getting this product here is gonna be six out of 13.2. And then times 100 if you wanna turn it into a percentage. And in this case, that's gonna come out here in this case to somewhere right around 55% for this product and 45% for this product. And so you might've been like, well, you're 3.6 times more likely to, to get the secondary product. Well, again, as long as you've got the equal number of chances, but I got six chances to form this product, I've only got one chance to form this product. And so as a result, they actually come out fairly even. So 55% versus 45%, but the first one would be the major product, but it's close. And so like we said, chlorination is not very selective. If you've got multiple products you can form, you're gonna form some of all of them. All right, but if we take a look at the same kind of calculation with bromination, and once again, we've only got two chances to form this product, one of two hydrogens we can replace right here. So, but for a secondary carbon, it's 99 is the relative likelihood there. So six chances, six different hydrogens we can replace to form this product. And so we'll take six, but just times again, a, a relative likelihood of one. And six times one is six, two times 99 is 198. And so in this case, if you add 198 and six, you're gonna get 204. And so we've got a likelihood of 198 out of 204 for this one. And then again, times 100. And this one only six out of 204. So, and if you work this out and multiply by 100, you're gonna get, this one comes out to 97% and this one, 3%. And notice if you, by all means, get a chance to replace a tertiary hydrant, it goes up even higher to 1600. And so overwhelmingly you can get, you know, uh, one major product in bromination oftentimes when you've got one substitution that's much more favored over any other. So if you're doing synthesis problems, we'll find out that we vastly prefer bromination much of the time just because it is so selective and we can get just one product. Now, if you've got, you know, something like say cyclohexane, so in cyclohexane, you've got 12 hydrogens and they're all equivalent. It doesn't matter which one you replace with a chlorine or a bromine, you're just gonna get chlorocyclohexane or bromocyclohexane. So if you've got something like this, well then take your pick, chlorination, bromination, whatever, because 
you've only got one possible product no matter what. But if it's something like propane here, where you've got two possible products, if your goal is to get one single major product, then you're way better off using bromination. You'll find out that we use it way more often in synthesis. Now, one thing to note about NBS here. Now, it turns out NBS can do the same thing as, as BR2. I shouldn't really say CL2, but the same thing as BR2. It's still selective. So, and it would still largely give you this major product right here. So 97% yield. Um, however, you probably wouldn't use it here if you were doing this in the lab. It would still work here, but it's more expensive as a reagent, NBS, than just plain old BR2 and light. And so if you, you were doing this in the lab, you just use BR2 and light. So you specifically use NBS in the lab when you're trying to, again, brominate allylically or benzylically. However, if you did it on paper, on something just like propane, it's not allylic or benzylic, it's still gonna give you the same product as BR2 and light. And on paper, that's beautiful. On a synthesis problem, that's beautiful. In the lab, it might be a little bit of waste of resources, a little more expensive and stuff, but on paper, it is lovely. And I just wanna make sure you're aware of that because from a synthesis perspective, you know, you gotta make sure if when it's allylic or benzylic that you have to use NBS, not BR2. But if you're using something that's not a lilac or benzylic, you can use NBS, but you're probably more likely to use BR2 in the lab. But which means if you're trying to brominate, you can always use NBS. But you got to be careful, you know, of when you use BR2 versus NBS, because if it's a lilac or benzylic, you have to use NBS. You don't have the option. You want to make sure you're aware of that. Let's take a look at one more type of question you might see in this context. So the other kind of question you might see regarding this uh, is they might give you a, a lovely reactant and then ask you the number of different either monochlorination or monobromination products. And you're more likely to hear about monochlorination because you likely get all the products and a fair amount of each of them. So the question might be how many different monochlorination products are possible? And they might tell you to either include or exclude different stereoisomers. And so in this case, I'm going to have you include all the different possible stereoisomers. So you got to factor in if you're forming chiral centers in this stuff. So if you look at this, if you looked at this from like an NMR perspective, you might realize that there's only three unique types of hydrons here. So these two hydrons are equivalent on this carbon. So the four hydrons on these two carbons are equivalent. And then the six hydrons on these two carbons are equivalent. So with three different types of hydrons, we can substitute in three different places. I can substitute on the middle carbon. I can substitute on either one of these carbons, or I can substitute on either one of these carbons to get three fundamental different regio isomers. Let's draw those out. So again, I can substitute on the middle carbon. I can substitute on one of these, or finally on one of the end carbons. And these are my options. And if we're including different stereoisomers, we then gotta go back and say, did we form any chiral centers? Well, when we substituted for a hydrogen here with this chlorine, that did not turn into a chiral center. It doesn't have four different groups because it's got two identical ethyl groups. But on this one, that is indeed a chiral center. It's got four different groups. And you can, in principle, if you replace one of the hydrogens, you'll get R. And if you replace the other one, you get S and you're going to get both. And so in this case, we're going to take the time to draw both since we were told to include all the different stereo isomers. All right. So there's two. And then finally, we've got this one here and where we substituted for the chlorine there, it is not a chiral center. So only one version of that molecule. And in the end, as long as we're including stereo isomers, we would get four different monochlorination products doing substitution just once with a chlorine. Now, if it said exclude stereoisomers, well, then we would have just talked about the three different regioisomers if we're excluding stereoisomers. But oftentimes they want you to include those, but they're usually pretty specific in the question in the way they ask it. In the next lesson, we're going to cover the mechanism for radical halogenation. And if you have found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? A couple of the best things you can do to help support the channel. And if you're looking for the study guides that go with my courses, if you're looking for practice problems and practice final exams, and I've even got a now a final exam rapid review for OCHEM 1, and I'll add another one for OCHEM 2 next semester, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.